Welcome everyone to the show. This is Ahmed Al Murabi, and you are listening to The Cyber Riddler, a podcast where we decipher the offensive and defensive side of the cyber world. Today's topic is about ransomware. So, ransomware is one of the most annoying malware types ever because they don't just infect your device, they encrypt and lock your files. And you, as the files owner, you will not be able to decrypt, recover these da data until you pay the ransom fee. And the ransom fee usually depends on the cyber gang who control the distribution. In the past, many cyber, many cyber crime groups distribute ransomware and infected innocent people, like the famous group, are evil, which is a Russian-based ransomware group, and they act as a ransomware as a service. service. And then we have another group like uh, the infamous uh, Conti, which is, a, which is another um, uh, group who do like double extortion methods. It means like the group withhold the decryption key and threaten to leak sensitive data as well. And we have a lot of um, groups like Black Cat, Lockbits, and so many others. Today, I have a special guest who has more than 25 years of experience when it comes to hacking, programming, networking, and cryptography. This is the most important part. Why? Because which is rare to find, like, infosec people, <laughs> infosec person who, like, uh, ha love cryptography. And it's because cryptography is complicated, and even it's more complicated in practice, and usually it's for uh, math majors who are interested in what, this kind of stuff. Um, so um, I'm happy to and to um, welcome Lance James, who is the, who is the CEO of uh, Unit Two Two One B, and um, I think I met I met Lance and the at Black Hat uh, when he delivered his talk about uh, Ziblin uh, ransomware and he, how he like recovered the key. I know it's a lot. We will go alongside um, the uh, how he like uh, discovered all of these kind of things, and um, how he like recovered all of the crypto stuff and the clusters. And we'll go through all of these kind of things. He published a great, great article. So without further ado, um, I'm going to uh, let uh, Lance introduce himself. And uh, so very warm welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on the show. This is uh, this is awesome, um, and, and I appreciate the show you're doing. This is this is great. Like, and, and more information is good for these kind of things. Um, so I'm Lance James. I'm the CEO of Unity Two One B. You did most of the great introduction, um, and uh, lately I, you know, actually today I'm literally helping someone with uh, ransomware <laughs> uh, <laughs> at my day job. So uh, working on another uh, factoring and cracking. Um, but yeah, like I've, 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 I've uh, I, I, you know, I'm just kind of one of those learners and, and uh, um, cryptography for me was always kind of fascinating because uh, I was a kid who like code, codes and ciphers. So like when I was a kid, so like it, uh, it played to me, that played a lot into security for me. So, yeah. That's, that's perfect. So, so just a question before we start, I think like into like math majors or like a cryptography uh, kind of things. Because um, it's rare to find someone who like love cryptography and do these kind of things. Usually, we do we use the products of uh, math majors and mathematicians, uh, and like uh, the work they do. And we don't like invent. Even you can't find like in GitHub, you can't find people who write more um, crypto projects uh, like Infosec. Well, usually in Infosec, we use these kind of projects. Um, but it's uh, so. What's the deal in there? Well, actually, I was a music major, uh, and I am actually a high school graduate, so I don't have any degree. Um, so I think for me, it was just, to me, I've always liked, so music, they say music and math kind of go together a little bit. So I was a classically trained violin and piano player since I was five. Um, and to me, that's all patterns, right? And cryptography is, is like, when you kind of look at the root of it, it's about mathematical patterns, and obviously, like, bigger crazy stuff too, like, you know, gets into big number theory and, and stuff like that. Um, but I found it uh, always fascinating. And here's the thing. I actually sucked at, I was good at math when I was younger, when I was a little kid, kid. And then high school, I didn't seem to like it because probably the math teachers. Um, and then when I get like hit my young adult side, 21 or so, I got back into it. I founded a, a thing called I2P uh, years ago, which was like before Tor, it was an invisible internet project. And it was a peer to peer thing. It's still around, but like, for me, it was a project to learn more about cryptography, for, to, to implement and like 
learn about like that. And to me, I found cryptography fascinating because it also is wider than just math. It's threat models, it's economics, it's finance. Like it's it's like you have to think about like because um, like there's a there's actually a conference called the Financial Cryptography Consortium or whatever, and it's really about like the the threat would be what government can break this like your threat models thinking about like how expensive or when will they be able to break this right because there's not really an uncrackable crypto it's just that do we have enough computers and enough time and right now like for instance if you take something like rsa or diffie hellman the whole point of it is it's not uncrackable the key is like the you know it's that you know done right with a large enough key it would take more than our lifetime to solve it and many other lifetimes. So the idea that would be that it would just, you know, it's not, uh, it's safe. Right. Um, so for me, I think it was just, I kind of fell into it, but I loved the way math worked. I loved how like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, it's just discrete logarithms to me were kind of like a fun thing where it's like overflowing a prime and then you couldn't really reverse it. And it was just, but it was to me still, I always saw it as security. Like to me, I thought it was actually kind of the root of original computer security because the challenge is, is the only thing secret should be the key. And that also still means you got to harden the systems. You got to like do everything else to protect that information. You know what I mean? So, um, but I just kind of found it fascinating and fell into it. And I think it's, to me, I wish more people would get into it as a hobby at least, because I think it plays a lot more um, into security than we realize instead of just using it, it, it is, fascinating like i wouldn't go and just homebrew my own crypto right i'm not i think you know the math experts that go through peer review and those people are you know those are still the kind of the the the, the gurus of the thing but like there's so much you can think about like if it weren't for that like moxie uh marlin spike, Marlon spike. Right? Does, Marlon yeah, Marlon does, spike yeah yeah signal right djb another guy that's like you know obviously does like dnssec but he also does crypto and and came up with like some of the the curves alternative curves and, uh, for ECC, you know, things like that. So like, um, that's all like, I mean, that still all plays into security, you know? So, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's kind of fun. Yeah. I'll, I'll just, uh, agree because, yeah. um, you, sometimes when we see like these algorithms, like when you hear about RSA, Diffie Hellman and all of these kind of algorithms will be like terrified. So if like, if like there's an, um, application or like ransomware who, who used, RSA, even if he's like used a buggy implementation of RSA, will be like, oh no, that's uh, uncrackable. Because the name itself will just give you the illusion that it's um, uncrackable, which in fact sometimes they have like implementation issue. So the, the so it's not like the math behind it, but the, the, right. the implementation uh, part will just um, take part. And also, it's sometimes the math and the implementation. So like one of the things that I found fascinating, I think all people that get into security should at least do like a fundamentals of cryptography. Like like, like I should be part of their coursework, right? Like as you're like learning networks, you learn this and that, like fundamental security, uh, so cryptography. And the reason why is like, I've learned about like polar, polar row attacks, baby step at Montgomery attacks, like poly Hellman attacks. Like today I was looking at index calculus attacks, right? Like, um, and these things do sound scary, right? And I remember when I was younger, I was, it took me forever to try to, I had to go look up the math because I wasn't an academic math guy. So I had to learn my symbols and all the stuff they have in papers, right? You know, and I was like, Wolfram Alfred was like my best friend or something, you know, like, I'm like, what does a symbol mean, <laughs> right? Like, like my wife's really good at math, you know, but, um, and so like, but like o over time, it's just another language, right? And so like, I, I just want to say from a mental perspective, don't be afraid of, of the cryptography, like both as a learner, and as someone on the defense, right? Yes, a lot of times it's true. Most of the RSA that's implemented probably be too more expensive to break it, right? Uh, in many cases, but there are that that shot. Like we got a lottery shot with Zeppelin. That was crazy. I've got a another one. I've figured out around how to go around uh, for some things. A major one out there. I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want the bad guys knowing about. Um, but essentially. Um, it's kind of like you've got to think like with it's a combination of math and hacker intuition. You got to like not, it's not always just math. It's sometimes like, huh, there might be because I look at it more like is there a vulnerability in the way they wrote this? Can I get inside their head of like how they would have written this? And there might be a mistake. Right. Because like if you take Zeppelin, it wasn't just that they did the 512 bit key. It was forensics that was involved and figuring out how to recover the key and undelete and like do all this stuff. Because in, in a technical sense, 
they could have still got away with it, but like, you know, I'm thinking forensically and cryptographically, right? Like we know we can break 512 bit keys. They, they were ephemeral keys and they usually do delete themselves, but is there a way to recover that key in, you know, in a way that we can do this and, and, yes. and then crack it. Right. And so that was like, that took more time, like a month of time to figure out if I could like forensically, you know, find, find the, percentage. find the primitives, yeah. finding right. the primitive before you like have having it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so why I'm saying this because we'll we'll go about uh, we'll go through uh, like a Zeppelin um, the ransomware, but why I'm starting with the cryptography because the cryptography itself is so expensive. Like um, in 2015, I published a, a tool called CryptoGhost, which is an Android-based application for encrypting files on the brain system. But the 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 the, the problem is that you have to maintain it. So it's mm -hmm. not uh, so you can't just uh, release a tool and then like uh, for cryptography you cannot just release a tool and then leave it. So that because yeah, no. after after if time a, if something gets found one a vulnerability gets found yeah or two yeah yeah, so, yeah like, and sometimes yeah. either either like in a theoretical point of view or sometimes in the code itself. So you have mm -hmm. to maintain it. So why why I'm going with this because ransomware authors they tend to just change their code over time because uh, because if they just leave it as it is, the way it is, it will be like crackable. And like in that's why like Lockbit have like version one and version two and now version three. And, and recently I'm, I'm just checking that there is uh, uh, Lockbit have this weird idea of bug bounty, bug, bug bounty on there. Like, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. I'm like, it's, it's, it's weird. Uh, man. <laughs> it's I, like I, a bug well, bounty on the Lockbit. Yeah, it is a trip. They were kind of a trippy group. Like, you know, what I mean? yeah. like, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, so understanding this background about uh, like cryptography. So when like did the ransomware era begin? So on a literal sense, it, it, it began in like 1991 was the first, like what they call a logic bomb, right? Like, you know, like there was viruses that were, you know, this is before like everybody's all connected, but like, you know, there were, you put a floppy disk it's called a logic bomb. It didn't hold things for ransom, but there have been cases in like very esoteric cases, but in the real sense of when it got real, like when it real application, this was 2013 with crypto locker, right? So like that was the first time we saw them properly use asymmetric encryption, you know, private and public key. And it was like, holy crap. They like, and it was kind of funny because security people have been kind of waiting for that day. Right. You know, like, it's kind of like, oh, well that was bound to happen. Right, we do have all the right crypto, open a cell, I mean, all this stuff, right? Like, I mean, you don't even have to go out and homebrew, you can just implement open a cell and, and be problematic, right? I mean, ransomware is simply a backup system. The difference is the threat actor has the key, you know what I mean? So, um, and so, uh, yeah, so like essentially, um, yeah, so uh, 2013 because... Crypto Locker. I remember this because I worked on it and I, built, I put together the Crypto Locker working group and we, got the, the things shut down probably faster than I think any case that we've ever worked with, with the like law enforcement. So it was crazy. So, yeah, yeah because, because why I'm mentioning that, because I remember in the early twenties, um, the two thousands, uh, people were, um, uh, people were like, uh, thinking about rats, like remote, um, uh, the, the rat, uh, malwares where they just, they want to, they are, um, thinking about infecting and controlling machines. They, yep. they weren't like uh, thinking about ran doing a ransomware and getting money out yeah. of it. They just want to like control the machine and they just play with the CD-ROM and all of these kind of things. Oh yeah, like they, back orifice. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, so to, boys and I. I used to play with that too and I'm like, you just do like a little Darth Vader sound while this tray is coming out. Yeah, so so many crazy <laughs> stuff at the, at the time. So at the time before like 2010, I remember people just was um, uh, thinking about just how to control a machine they weren't yeah. thinking about doing like a ransomware even like mm -hmm. even the buggy or uh, adwares or the malwares would be like just to infect the machine to take control of it nothing more nothing less exfiltrate data mm -hmm. and that's it but after like 2011 12 and 13 as mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. people are start using uh, the, um, the ransomware to get more money and effective and and they that the Bitcoin helps for for uh, collecting all of these uh, money uh, because yep. there's the, the money trail. So yep. 
I'll, so I have another question for you. So which, like, the methods, though, for ransomware to distribute, like phishing emails, you have, like, loaders. Sometimes other malware groups, like cyber gangs, they have the offer their services, like ransomware as a service, and they, um, they distribute their other group's malware uh, into their line of, uh, so it's like Emotet or, or Z-Loader. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a, it, like, they, peer, yeah. uh, like CryptoLocker was, in 2013, was peer-to-peer -peer Zeus, right? Because like they already have distribution channels, they already have the infections. So like you know, so like I was like at like against like when you think about Russia, because that's where a good primary source of this stuff is coming from, the, right? The best malware authors. <laughs> it's a business for them. They, yeah. like, think of it as Russia as like a company, right? Like in their world, they don't think of it as criminal. They think of it as business because of just the way that um, Eight there's to a five lot of kind of thing. There's, there's a lot of history there. But the point being is is that. Uh, some of it, you know, we kind of caused, you know, but like politically speaking, but like essentially at that point, you know, after the Cold War, things changed a bit and everybody kind of had to fend for themselves. And then also there's there's some corruption that like started, you know, to the top. Right. And so everybody was basically, how do we make money? Right. And um, ironically, though, in Russia, ransomware, when it first started coming out, was like considered like bottom feeder, like all the like big top like malware authors like hated ransomware authors and people they were like this is crap this is like ruining our business because it's you know <laughs> you know they kind of <laughs> like they said it's like takes no skill and it's just like you know it's just messed up right like they actually ironically there's like a beef between the two worlds there for like you know like uh people who actually write zeus and things right so like um but yeah it was through distribution channels peer-to-peer -peer zeus emotets uh on, you know we've seen uh, a few uh there's also other ways now i'm seeing also is rdp is a big one like exploits and rdp or like they'll sell out lists and stuff so like lower tier uh ransomware nowadays gets in through like some open rdp, RDP s server out there and, and you know there are, there are VPN, other groups you know there are other yeah. groups who like they don't do anything except for handing you like an rdb credentials and rdb yep. valid servers that's, yeah, and just, that's it because they don't that's it yeah, yeah because they don't yeah. want to go to like into the trouble of like doing the ransomware the ransom right. uh, attack they just want to it's sell you the rdb yeah. It's like a it's like a pyramid of like, you know, you got your coder at the top, right? And even the person who might sell it might not even be related to the coder, right? That guy's taking a cut, right? And then there's like a bigger cut somewhere else in the distribution or here's some exploit, you know, like payload stuff or here's some mailing list or like, you know, I thought it used to be mailing lists. You target those, you spear fish in and go. Now they're just like, here's creds, here's creds, here you go, right? Um, and then they just charge for those creds. Everybody's making a piece off this, right? And it's everybody in that little like, Supply, it's a supply chain. So, <laughs> go supply. After the supply, you know, yes. if you want to, you know, just go back and go to the top of the supply chain and go after that, right? So, um, but yeah, so it, is, it becomes down to a supply chain thing because it's a in that world, in the dark web, the deep, web, that's all business now, right? It's like they don't see it as criminal. I mean, they know it's kind of criminal, obviously, but like they don't, it's their business, you know. There's sometimes even like 24 7 polite chat support I've seen on like, I think it was Lockbit or something, and they were all like really nice, and you're just like, hello, da -da 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 -da, you know, <laughs> just like. <laughs> Okay. This is crazy. So, yeah. There uh, you but 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 usually, but now, uh, but um, yeah, usually I'm seeing like phishing emails and the emails that have the like, um, uh, attachments to it or something. Sometimes they just imitate and these kind of uh, uh, malware. I'm not lately. I'm not seeing like ransomware distributed on phishing emails, or I'm not it's seeing not the, the best. Big, right? It's not the big thing. It's That's like credentials right. now. Like, how do we already get in? Like they usually go to someone and then there's also people who also like just handle the negotiations. They have nothing to do with the ransomware. They're just a cust like almost like a call center that just handles the intake of the ransoms. Right. So, so it's all kind of weirdly buffered, you know, it's like a so, PS professional uh, services, you know, uh, pre-sales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They outsource that and they outsource this so, and they outsource uh, this. Exactly. Yeah, kind of funny, so, you know. so from your experience, uh, what is like the latest methods for, um, or their tactics for evasion? Uh, like what is like what malware authors do like from from experience like what in the latest malware you like reverse engineered or you checked so what is like the evasion uh, kind of things they do or their tactics to hide um, uh, the detection and they will make the ransomware will not be visible uh, because nowadays defend let's let's just um, say this defenders is doing a good job uh as as um as a um, uh, out of the box uh windows doing right. a good job in detecting these kind of things so right. so 
what what is like the latest evasion techniques for so, the so so really it's like it's twofold because like all right so like in most ransomware things there's a live operator that's in there before they even drop a ransomware right they've got a few steps they've got get escalation get all this stuff and they put on their tools and stuff like that's kind of like a thing that's why you always like see like if you if you're lucky right and i want to say this because there's a lot of good to this it's all ransomware always sounds like oh we're failing right but there's 90 percent of ransomware that's thrown out there on the on the you know in the wild most of the stuff is caught you know what i mean like most people don't get it it's just you know when you do hear about it it's usually big and it sucks right um but there's usually a persistent uh, player involved right the edr so they either are shutting off the edr uh, like hand operator Right. You know, using a tool to shut off the service because they maybe escalate to admin. So a lot of the times they're not going to get in and start just loading up a payload. So a lot of times ransomware doesn't have to do some crazy obfuscation or anything. And actually, by the way, the secret to getting around EDR is actually writing like you're a Stack Overflow engineer, not like you're a Metasploit engineer. If you obfuscate, that's what they're looking for. But if you actually literally type in your function, this is stealing your passwords, <laughs> it gets in most of the time. Like, so it's actually the hacking and all the crazy stuff is actually that because when i look at mal the ransomware it's not like it's not like hiding there but here are some techniques that they do i've just seen some do it's like code caving or dll inject side loading right side load. so sometimes they, they use right. the search order like uh, hijacking. Yes, yeah yeah so they'll hijack something that's already smart screens like already like trusted right well obviously they'll steal certificates and then sign their stuff with those certificates that's another that's a but like you know so like but that's it's hard a, right yeah. Let's, let's, oh yeah, that's not an easy route. But the yeah. side loading is not easy either. But like, if they've already got a package in there and it's side loaded and it just drops out and stuff like that, and then the side load is the thing that's dropping the rest of it, um, that usually doesn't get picked up by if it's brand new, you know, things like that, and it's not like looking too obvious. Like it won't always get picked up by EDR, right? Um, but it's like the thing with it is, is ransomware. It's almost like red teamers first, like bad guy red teamers, but like red teamers first. They go in, they get everything shut down. And that's the thing. That's the reason why they usually succeed is they shut down the EDR, right? Like, that's the thing. I'll have some kind of tools in there. I mean, every time I've done forensics, it's like a bunch of tools that look like you're on a red team. And they'll be in there for like four to 11 days before they even like, you know, start spreading because they want to see if they got the administrative, they got all this, they got that, what access will the networks like enumerate on? And then they drop the bomb and leave, right? You know, but um, side loading is a trick. Um uh, code caving or things like that or stuff like hiding in like um, uh, syscalls, like the thing where you can have notepad and then have that call like with the there's a command line that does that DLL call and it's like run DLL 32.exe and then you can call another thing, things like that. Another function, yeah. Right. But a lot of it is actually basic. I'm in your system. I'm just going to shut down your systems. Like that is actually usually what's causing the problem is that they were already in there and they're basically setting it up so that this thing won't get detected by turning off anything uh that's going on so it's not usually like some like super crazy evasive tactic thus that's why ransomware is popular is that it's not it's mainly required mainly requiring an operator which we can also buy we can just buy the guy who breaks in right you know what i mean so you can buy that that service someone's got like oh i got you know 1000 shells you want them right you know like you pay a sh you know like you know when i say shells like a remote rdp or whoever they got access to stuff right they sell that stuff on Discord and Telegram all freaking day, all long, right? Someone buys that stuff, they're in there, you know, and they'll even be like, this has already worked out, like it's undetectable. They'll tell you about the system, da, da, da. And again, a lot of easy targets are just standard EDRs, right? You know what I mean? Like Windows Defender, this and that, all that stuff. And and this isn't a diss. I think EDRs are, you know, they're doing what they can. Um, but yeah, it's not, it, the ironic part is you want to hear, oh, it's going to be sexy. But the problem with ransomware is it's basic that's kicking our butt because it looks like normal operations. Like, for instance, another thing, the reason why some of the stuff does well is um, it'll use the native a a API crypto libraries from Windows. From right? Windows, or they Linux. don't uh, yeah. implement their own uh, libraries. Right, they don't. So they can like use a BitLocker type function or a Crypt32 DLL or any of those things. They'll use the random seed from the Windows system. So nothing, it's standard, you know, calls, right? Um, obviously, they'll do process injection and things like that so that it looks like a standard call or whatever. And it's like like that. Um, like I said, it's either signing, DLL side loading or process injection, code caving kind of stuff. And then it's just, uh, you know, in there, there, but or turning off the system, like I said, which is very, very common, right? So like, and then that is just like, let it go, right? And um, even if it's like, say the network picks it up, you, you still lost maybe a major server, right? You know, things like that, which... 
which can cause a lot of harm or something like that. The worst ones are the ones that go on the network because then it, you don't know where the heck it's encrypting from. And, and there's some shared open network and you got administrator access yes. and it's just like, oh, it's a know, mess. It, it will be a, it will be a mess because you didn't know what's like the latest uh, a server it reached. So you mm -hmm. didn't know where to, 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 to look after that. But the thing is, um, ironically, that um, PowerShell has been used a lot. Even yes. even even if it's 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 heavily logged, and the system yeah. and this the the EDR is logging each bit of bit of it, but still they are using PowerShell for their oh, operations. Yeah. I know Honestly, I don't. Yeah. If you're not using PowerShell on your like desktops or servers or whatever, like if you're not actually having to use that, turn that thing off. Like just uninstall and get rid of PowerShell. Like and then like alert and block any PowerShell. Like not like the PowerShell.exe. You know what I mean? Like. Like that would solve a good portion of breach problems. You would immediately detect because the minute someone's like almost every hacker days, they go to this PowerShell because it's an entire Turing complete language. You, you just like eliminate the ability to do pa macros and PowerShell. You you solve half of Windows security problems. So, yeah, uh, the, 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 the problem is still uh, after like the PowerShell is heavily logged, but still people till now, like last week, I'm seeing uh, someone who like did an obfuscation and it bypassed an EDR. So till mm -hmm. now, EDR yeah. is not, even though it's like logging yeah. everything, but still uh, Arms people are, Arms are, yeah, are yeah. bypassing yeah. it. Um, like yeah. every day. Yeah. So uh, I think now we reached to the point of uh, explaining the, uh, <laughs> the zip line right somewhere. And I want to, because I read the, the article and I want you like to go the for because you guys did a lot of things in there, like factoring, mm -hmm. like RSA, uh, in co covering like AS uh, keys and then finding the, the RSA problem of factoring it, and then the RC4, and then the problem is how to like because it's crypto, one bit matters. So if they if you if you just missed one bit, you will be like having a totally uh, and different when I was, key. For uh, like a whole month, I was like there was like a, a week of like me struggling with that. I wasn't you, getting the right bit, and it was like some way I had misunderstood how the the footers work. Yeah, and, and you know because so, yeah. I work with I work with cryptography sometimes, and uh, I play with it. I, I sometimes I reach to the point of, is it a one bit? Is it a one byte? You know you. Oh no no you, the type it's, it's if we're it's not using like, the data types. It's like, yeah, it's like you got to get your Indian, you got to get your hexadecimal yeah. down, right? Like, it's like, okay, big You have Indian, to do a, a big review there. <laughs> yeah, you do. No, I, I actually have a buddy that also was on the paper, right? That, that, you know, Joel on that side, that he's my fresh eye. So I'll like spend a month and then I'm going to be tired. And I'm like, Joel, I've got like one bit or bite or something missing. And he's that guy that's like, yeah, this is that little thing. And he, he's so detailed, like compared to me. So like, he, you know, I, I'm, I'm tired after a month and then I'll like be calling him like, all right, I'm calling in Superman over here, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, cryptography is like, if you ever notice, like cryptography papers are never worked on alone, right? Because there's so much, there's so much detail and then pack it back and forth, right? Um, so like, yeah, so like I'll walk, I'll walk through what, what Zeppelin is in the story a little bit. Is that probably a good yeah. way to start yeah yeah so start okay. from like uh, the the beginning of having it okay. and then running it and then you just found the keys after the keys uh, after yeah, key yeah. and find the rca ironically so go for it. actually i've never run zeppelin that's the fun part so yeah it's even no, more fascinating why i've never I'm saying actually that run the actual ransom oh <laughs> <laughs> why, why I'm saying this because I saw you guys put a lot of work on it and I want to yeah. be like you you get like a good credit for it because yeah um, so over to you Lance okay so like all right so two and a half years ago it was right around um, what was it two and a half years ago right before like COVID really 2019 hit, I think yeah it's like 2019 like we I get a call from a buddy for my company and I was, I was actually leaving my other job and like finally kind of like focus on my, I mean, my company was already running, but like kind of give it some love and focus. Right. And, uh, I got a call, like, this was more like a week. Cause like Allison was on it too. Uh, and so like, they're like, Hey, you want to help a homeless shelter? I'm like, yeah, of course. Right. So it was a Canadian homeless, homeless, like they're a nonprofit for helping the homeless. And like, so it's like a whole thing, but like, you know, they're, they do a lot of work. It's like a, Catholic, you know, like center that like does a lot of pumping like money in to help homeless people, right? And nonprofit, all this stuff. So they didn't have all the money to, <laughs> they did, they were not set up to even expect something like this, right? Uh, and so, 
you know, we looked at it, we consulted with them. I finally asked for like, hey, can we get like a couple of the files just to look at it, right? And I was coming off of a previous job. I hadn't even touched any technical. I was running an engineering team at the time, right? So it's been, been a bit since I even been on the groundwork, right? Um, been like more like people leading and stuff, right? So, so like I look at it, you know, and I, um, so I, I, I look at it and I said, so I had to, uh, I, I took a little look at it and it said like this like thing in the, inside the top of the header files, like Zeppelin all capitalized. And so I'm like, well, let me look that baby up. Right. And Allison is with me and Allison is fun. She's our chief research officer. And she's also like, like a sister to me. Um, and so like, and she lives down the hall, you know, so like, uh, like we're family. Um, and so like she, I said, oh, maybe we can crack this. And she's like, and I love her skepticism. And the skepticism, skepticism plays a major part in this because it's what drove me to prove like, like, ooh, like, I don't like do this, like, I want to prove you wrong, but I'm like, oh, you're skeptic. Let me see. Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, okay. so, uh, you know, so Zeppelin comes and I'm like, like, I look up some papers and I think Allison found a paper on, on, on Zeppelin about like, just kind of like they're already reverse engineering. Cause like no point in re-reverse engineering. We hadn't got the deal with this homeless shelter. We were just trying to see what we can do and what we know. Right. So they ended up like, I don't know if they paid the ransom or not or whatever. Of course, we wouldn't have figured it out in time anyways, right? But essentially, it introduced me to Zeppelin. And it was the first time I was back playing around with something. And I was like, oh, well, maybe it's crackable. And Allison was like, oh, you know, the days of cracking, uh, you know, like ransomware nowadays is over, right? Like they've gotten good and da 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 da. So again, lottery. And I'm a lucky, I'm a lucky guy. It's kind of weird. But I always fall into things that work. So like essentially... I start, you know, Allison sends me the silence paper. There's this great, great paper, actually. He did a great job of reverse engineering the 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 the, the Zeppelin thing, right? Because, like, if you're, it's already out there, it's better than having to do it from scratch. So uh, so I start reading it. It teaches me about the footers. It teaches me the process. And then it talks about, like, them having a 2048-bit key. And then they have these ephemeral keys. And I'm going down reading it. And I have eight whiteboards. No joke. Um, so I pull up one of my whiteboards. And I'm getting like, and, and Allison describes it as a roller coaster ride. So I'm getting all excited for a second. I'm like, ooh, this might be actually a vulnerability. And I'm like, they don't see it. And I like write that thing on the board and then I keep going. And then I go, oh, never mind. And then I go, ooh. And I like, as I'm reading, it literally was like this like highlight of emotions down and up, right? And then I felt like I was crazy because it's, it's been a bit since I've been super technical, right? You know, so I'm like, I think we might be able to break this, right? Um, you know, so. Uh, Allison's like, ah, I doubt it, da, 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 blah, 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 blah. Even my, my boy Joel was like, ah, you know, we'll see, like this. And so it like made me kind of do this. Now we got really lucky because there was a client of ours that had Zeppelin that did want to pay us. But I told him, I said, I'm still trying to figure this out. And they paid like the research and they helped us out. Like they literally like paid to figure it out, right? Because they knew okay. me and they're like, I believe in you, right? You know, but I'm like, it might take a month. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah, it's not like it's going anywhere and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So like, they actually sent me data to work with and all these other things and stuff like this, right? So then I get into looking at it. At first, my, like I said before, the biggest thing was not that we could, we all know we can crack a 512 bit RSA key. It was the trick was getting access to that key, right? Yeah. So assembling it, assembling it from the system. Yeah, because it was it hides itself. Okay, so it, it it'll so how Zeppelin works when they do it is they have these ephemeral keys they create. There's a master key that's embedded. It's a public one. You're not going to crack that. It's not happening. It's 2048 bit, right? And so what'll happen is they'll create because okay, so this is the fun part. So Zeppelin was on the market as a do do it yourself like a DIY like a ransomware like kit you can buy, right? Okay. Um, you know, written in Delphi, likely Russian. Um. And so, but the customers in the dark web were complaining about its speed. Like it was encrypting too taking, slowly. Yeah, taking a lot of time to, yeah, to because, finish you know, the you're process. Yeah, nowadays with people with terabytes of data, right? So that's, you know, so they decide to do two things. They do a Stripe encryption, which is we're not going to encrypt the entire file. We're going to do a mathematical, you know, ca you know calculation, calculation. Of, the, yes. of the file, right? Um, and then what we'll do is essentially like, encrypt sections and it was about 16k each section right so you know and it would just basically you could figure out the math but the point is is that it would strip these right and it would like encrypt sections of the thing for speed that way it doesn't have to encrypt an entire like if it gets like a big sql file or something it just encrypts enough that it's it hurts and it's, the, and it's enough to to mess up the whole file exactly right so like you know um so I'm, I, I was looking at that, and then also the second thing it did was it created these ephemeral keys. So each server will have a generated 512-bit key, 
So it'll do its like RSA AES keys and it'll encrypt to this 512 bit key, which puts it, it puts in the registry under like public key, Zeppelin, blah, 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 whatever, user software. It hides itself, but it's in there while it's running. And then it deletes itself when it leaves. Like it deletes Zeppelin, it deletes, it, it's pretty, and it, and it's even pretty gone. And delete, delete even the, 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 the executable self. Yes, yes, yeah, of course, right? So it, it's, yeah, most people do not have access to the executable. Even if we didn't, we ran it again, it would generate a new key, so it's not helpful, right? I've only seen one time where they, there is a mode they can like, put the key like hard-coded into it. I've seen it one time, and actually it was a, kind of a really good day for that because I was, everybody was searching so for the key, and I'm like, the system wasn't know, let me look at the malware, <laughs> right? You know, but like that's even makes it worse. So, so either way, so it's in the air registry in this side. So my challenge was forensically, okay, um, okay, I did run ran a Zeppelin. I ran him in a VM, but I didn't like do any reversing. I just ran it to see how the key would go and then like let it leave, right? So like, safe, you know, yes. do that. Yeah. So that then I would try to like see what I did was set up like a memory, like so in the virtual box, I had like um IPC access so I could actually dump memory and all this stuff. So I actually spent most of the time doing um VAD dumps like uh virtual allocation uh, descriptor like memory dumps, like recall volatility stuff to see if we could like, does it, how long does it stay in memory? That was a bust, right? As a whole bust, right? Like it, the minute it's gone, it's out, right? Even if we kept the machine on, it's gone. Like it, it's pretty smart with all that, right? Um, so then like I started looking at like yet another registry parser, right? Uh, it's called YARP, right? YARP. Um, and so like <laughs> they, I started modifying it because I obviously needed to deal with like transaction files and a few other things. But essentially, it's, it, it gave me a really good head start. It was a small modifications for some things. And then I just modified it mainly to find what I wanted. And so I started seeing, and again, it wasn't perfect. Sometimes, like, my tests, I would, oh, that one didn't show up or this and that. Like, for instance, if there was too much activity in the registry, it pushes it down. But I did find something much later that actually does go to the transaction log. So if you have, like, autopsy or some kind of forensic thing, you can grab it there because it goes, it pushes down into the NT user you can possibly pull it there, but if it not, you go to the dot log files and it might be there. Yes. So it, you know, depending, um, but essentially, you know, reading all Mandy and stuff on like, you know, registry parsing and uh, how it all works and stuff. So I finally get this working where I feel like it was, yeah, good enough. And I, I was, you know, I had my test samples were showing 95 to 96% positive, like recovery time. Like meaning I always tell customers, I, you know, we have to see if we can. And so we made a rule when we actually offered this to shut down your machines immediately, right? And then we'd give them a USB like Linux box to get the file so that like there would be no Before traffic from the registry, right? You know? Yeah. So yeah, as, as much as possible, right? Because so, I think there is like five minutes window uh, or, or four minutes window until everything yeah. like collapse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so like, so essentially though, like we could carve most of this out, which is great. So now I have the key, right? So I've got this public key and sometimes you'd see all this, the bigger public key too. And so then you had to, like, the big work was not, like, I, I had to set up factoring, obviously. Um, so that's where I, like, called DigitalOcean, and and, and uh, there's a thing called the Hatch Program. So if you're a new company, uh, you know, they'll give you some, like, you know, loaner boxes to, like, test something uh, for a lot less price or practically free in this case um, and stuff. And it's, like, a first year, like, you know, first time, first year. It's kind of a promotional thing for DigitalOcean. So I, I tested on, like, you know, 800 CPUs on there, which is actually slow comparably, but I just wanted to look at benchmark costs. Like if I do more CPUs, like it's, it's going to be faster time, but I still need to look at costs, right? So we, we, I set up Cato NFS, which is like, uh, uh, so cracking RSA, there's a four stage, uh, the best way to factor uh, uh, something like RSA, it's called a general number field sieve. It's like a big math thing. And it's got like four major stages. Three of those stages are distributed. So you can set up and like, do a bunch of boxes and they can talk to each other. And Cato NFS does a great job of like managing clusters across it. And so I guess, but my, I had to spend like, like weeks on like writing scripts to automate all the stuff. Right. Otherwise it's like a lot of manual process. Right. Cause I also realized on our first. So did you miss it? Did you miss this up for the factoring part? Because I well, think that's it's why easy. I it was like totally. <laughs> it's oh, easy to first, miss this up. Oh my and you spent four hours. The wrong too. keys. I got like four like uh, factor yeah. things and it was literally a wrong digit at the end, right? It was like, and I'm like, oh my God. And you have to wait. So it's like, ah, oh, oh, oh. right. Imagine you know? for five hours of, and then oh. you, fight, you are on the wrong key or there is a one yeah. bit missing. <laughs> so yeah. you. Yeah. So now I, I have JSON files and everything that makes it like, it does it automatically and make sure that I like take the key from the NT register. Like I, but I'll get into that in a second. 
So like I do the factoring and I finally, the second time I get a pop for success. Cause I'm like, Ooh, wrong digit. Right. You know, <laughs> also yeah. took too soon. What was like, why did that take too soon? Right. Uh, plus you shouldn't have four, you should have two, right? P and Q. Right. So, so I run this thing and stuff and, and that, but it was actually like, I, I, we figured it, uh, figured out the cost was pretty low, blah, 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 blah. We're like, okay, this is totally doable. That part. Then it was just automation of all that. Right. You know, like setting that up properly, all this stuff. Then here's the funny thing. Okay. So now I have like the factoring key, right? Then I have to write the decryptor. That's the hard part, right? So, you know, um, that's where it's like it, it bytes and bits and like all this stuff, right? So I'm reading the footer headers, like the footer from Scilance that's and stuff right. like this as close as I can. But like there was even like the way it was communicated, there was a misunderstanding of one of them that still also didn't, art, like they do like this thing where they use an RC4 key that's in front of the header. And then like, that's a 32 by key. And then like the rest of it is at that. And you parse that, but there was one that was holding me back and I'm like, why am I not getting the right you know, key or why is this not working? And this is where I called Joel and he goes, oh, that one's also an RC4, but it didn't really say it that well. Like, I think it assumed you knew that, but like, you know, when you're literal and you're in the zone, it, you feel like, oh, that, that one must not be RC4, right? So finally got out of that, like oh, another week to figure it out. Uh, I was living in Python Jupiter to, to, to do all this because like, it, yes. you know, um, and then there was Toshin, uh, like the RSA, like version they had and stuff. Some people use Euler's Toshin. The other one is like, I think, Michelangelo or Michael's, Michael's Toshin. This one used Michael's Toshin, if I'm recalling correctly, but like a special Toshin algorithm, right? Both are fine, but you got to know which one it is or it gives you a totally different calculation, right? Um, and so like I had to put all that code together, put all the RSA code together. Then remember the striped encryption, right? So like it's interweaving while it also has like clear text. So I had to write stuff that literally, like I'd say this is a wee thing because this is where Joel's like smartness comes into is that essentially we like put together like this like thing where it collects all the cipher text. And the good news is about this is at the end of footers, uh, Silence thought it was just a bunch of zeros uh, for like this like extra space, but it actually was those offsets that are on the stripes. So we figured it out calculating wise, but then we also realized. So is it like a padding? Is it like a padding to it? It's not padding. It's like um, it's telling you where in the file is encrypted on which which section first. Oh, uh, like an and offset. And then it'll give you another. It. Yeah, it's offsets. Literally two offsets, three offsets, okay. four offsets. The, the version that maybe um, Silence was looking at didn't generate the key yet. So maybe it had the zeros only or, or didn't encrypt a file yet. Or maybe, it, I don't know what happened, right? But like, if it's small, the file's too small, you don't really have a first, you know, like it's not going to yes. generate like all that. So it'll be zero, right? So maybe they did it with a very small file, right? But what was cool is we figured out the calculation, right? But also the calculation's in the footer. So that's also even easier. <laughs> <laughs> so we figured this out. But you have to write like basically a footer like, uh, you know, translator, right? And it has to follow the footer because the footer tells, you know, you have to kind of reverse how the decryptor works, yeah. right? So the footer comes in and then you, you know, essentially like follow it. Okay, this half step, this half step. And but, but like the collecting ciphertext was tricky because then you have all that, you got to keep it in like almost like a, a matrix, right? And then you got to put all the data back into to place. So you have and to together, get, like yes. the clear text and stuff. So it's like this interweaving magic, right? Um, so that was like the trickier part than like AES, right? And then AES CBC, right? The thing that gave it away is if you decrypt it pro properly, and I did struggle with this, was the IV, like how they did IV. So AES CBC, the initial vector. a key and initial vector, initialization vector, uh, you know, basically, you know, combined so, together. So, so, yeah. So, so yeah, but like essentially, it's uh, it's going to be like incremental from the last chain, right? That's how that kind of works, right? Is it's a cipher block chain, so it'll take the next one and then the next one. And I somehow was like getting it wrong. And this is where Joel came in and he was like, oh, yep, it's actually this thing. And then we got the 666, like, because you got to look for that 666 header, right? And then stuff. So, like, he helped me on the IV stuff, right? Um, and so uh, essentially, we finally got this. And then you got to remove the prefix to get the file back to normal, right? But at least you get the 666 tells you that there's, you can assert that if it's not there, then the encryption's wrong, right? There is, because uh, one thing, because the you, 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 usually you know, when you have like uh, 256, because it's uh, AS and 256 bit key. Mm -hmm. So you have like 128 bit block, block cipher. Yeah. So where the ID's you, gonna be the same yeah. size as the block, so, so 16 by yes. block, yeah. Yep. So that, yeah. that, that will make it tricky when you just try to do it yourself, like with Python. Well, there's padding in that, right? Because if the last set of yes. blocks are missing so, sets of data, there's So to complete the 128-bit yeah. uh, yeah. block. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So that's, that's like crazy uh, part of it. 
That's always tricky because you never know if they did it right or they did the padding. Yes. And then if you're doing it right or da, da, da. also it was like a month in and my brain was getting fried. Um, so I had Joel do my fresh eyes and we fixed that. And then we got there and then we just basically wrote a decryptor. Then I spent time paralyzing it and like making it faster because like Python's slow. So I put a lot of it in C and then like kind of created like a Cython type module, like so that the uh, the main thing could be in Python, but like the actual speed would be in C, right? Um, and then I had my first like major victim and I realized how long it was, was like, like how much time I had to put in to like, and they were paying our, us for our time, of course, right? You know, it's just that. But I felt like I didn't want to be more expensive than the cost of the ransom, you know, itself, itself right? And consulting hours, like, you know, we did a lot more for them. We helped them with the backup. So it's just, there's more that goes into it. It's not just decrypting, you're done. There's a lot, like it's about a month plus, even if you decrypt the same day, there's about a month plus of new crap you have to do integrity on the new systems. You got to like pretty much gold image everything out like restart your systems, get, you know what I mean? It's like the whole thing. And then, um, but what was actually kind of cool is also is that I kind of learned from that. And I never done UI development before. And I decided to learn how to do UI development in Python. And so I started like taking PySimple GUI, something quick, you know, nothing like, like TK is cool, but I mean, it's just like a whole learning curve. So I was like, oh, this seems easy. So I started making like a step one, do this. And so it would like do a Slack to us. So like they'd find the key and it would help them find the key on their end. Then it would send the key to our Slack. Then we would, it would automatically like, they have to sign it, you know, a, 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 you know, some paperwork. And then it would like, we would send it to the factoring. It would factor, then send back on our Slack the key when it was done, shut off all the computers, right? Automatically all the stuff, you know, saving money. Uh, and then like it would go, you know, we would take that file and put it back into our uh, the decryptor. We'd send them that and they would they'd basically be gone to ready to go. Right. So now like, like we could just say, here's the cost of our factoring you know, uh, you know, and plus a little bit of time, but not really. And it was like pretty much automated. So now we weren't like charging so much, plus this wouldn't scale anyways. Um, and I learned UI and now I kind of love UI development. Um, <laughs> so like, uh, so yeah, cause I wanted to think about the customer, right? The, the, the client, like they're already having a hard day and it's great that I'm on there with them and stuff. And you know, all those experiences they're willing to pay for, but I'd rather than pay less when under such stress, you know what I mean? So I figured out how to automate it sent them an auto CD that would like, like it boot up and it would automatically pop up everything they need to do and find the thing and then send it to us. And so it would be a whole walkthrough. And we, we did that. Um, and we did that for like two years in secret so that we didn't want to let anybody change the software in Zeppelin. Right. Um, and they still haven't changed it, which is, you know, good. I've seen one version that has like 1024 bit RSA, but it's kind of rare that I see it. I see it a couple times a year, you know, kind of thing. Um, and so, but that was basically it. And then like, yeah, we just kept helping people f until it uh, kind of like cleared out. And then we were like, you know what? I think now it's like, it seems to be cleared. I mean, we got some lag over sometimes with Zeppelin, but um, yeah, it's been, uh, yeah. So that's how we kind of did it. <laughs> no, it's amazing. So, uh, I, I saw yeah. the article. I know that the, you, you, wrote, you wrote the article, but I know that the amount of work uh, in the background is enormous. So yeah. so it's like, is there like a, a new variants of uh, Zeppelin or uh, that we know only? I haven't, I've seen, okay. So recently we helped someone with the, uh... Uh, I'm not going to say the other ransom. It was a double ransomware. Someone else used it. I'm not going to say the other one because I figured a way around it. Okay. Um, just, it's a big one, so I don't want to know. Um, but uh, it's not about your show. It's just, I don't want to bag out. So, yeah. So, like, that was a hard day because, like, it was an awesome. It turned out really awesome because I figured out in real time how to crack this other one. Like, literally on the fly. <laughs> it was like, I, I tell you, I'm lucky. It's, that's the thing. I'm lucky. So, I, like, figure this out. And we get past that part. You know, and then their VMs start coming up and we thought everything was safe, but we forgot their VMs were on snapshot mode. So it, it, we thought like the oh. Zeppelin was gone and most of the files didn't get encrypted. But then by morning they call me and they go, shit, you know, <laughs> so like, so that happened. Um, that version was interesting because we were like, why is there one key on all across all these servers, right? Usually it's one server has a different key extension. One server has a different key extension. You got to yes. go hunting for the key. And, and luckily there was like, x-force there and a few like there's a great forensics guy so they actually got the malware right they actually got the malware in time right um so the good you know because it was in the vm state so that was good right so we got it and extracted it and then i finally like had this weird hunch and i'm like let me take a look at the malware real quick and i just literally threw it on virus total and did the strings thing and i'm like there's the freaking key it's actually embedded in the malware so the public key was actually like the 512 one was in there and i'm like 
Okay, let's so, go crack, right? And, uh, so so they, 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 they it saved out. you yeah. the trouble of like finding the key yeah. and extracting not, it. They just gave yeah. it to you and you stopped factoring immediately. I was like, yeah, I think they may have thought that was more secure. It's put it in the malware. And I'm like, that's not any more secure, right? Actually, if anything, your other way was better. And I'm not sure if that was a new version as a response because it was after the article. But like where I, I thought it was is that there might have just already been like a flag that allowed them to just do one key and embed it versus like maybe a randomized uh, key. There might be settings. Um, I'd have to look at like the, the Zeppelin front end. Um, and then like the other version, but this was while we were still in secret mode, was that there was a 1024-bit RSA version. And uh, I saw like two instances of it in the entire time. And we've like helped like 35 to 40 victims and stuff right so like i saw two instances uh and it has nothing to do with our article that, that was already out there and i was uh there was a virus company antivirus company that called me and said hey have you seen this one right and i'm like oh well we can't do much there right you know but um but it would seem to be pretty kind of low in the wild and like people mainly bought the main one uh which uh and i haven't seen any major changes not that you zeppelin guys please you know keep doing what you're doing with the same one please <laughs> <laughs> No, that's wow. uh, that. That's great. Um, I'll I'll uh, make sure to have uh, a link to your article um, mm -hmm. in the in description. Mm. In the the lesson is: don't mess with the homeless because you're going to get a bunch of hackers paying attention. Two, don't sacrifice. Like I'm not saying this to criminals, but it's funny. But the same just thing we have in our industry is when we sacrifice like uh, speed and customer dependency, like for security. Guess what happens? Mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I, I want to thank you, James Ed Lance, for um, mm -hmm. for being in the show and uh, mm -hmm. accepting the the invitation. And true, uh, true honor. It's it great chatting with you. So. Thank you, and thank you for uh, like doing all of this work. Um, I think before we, we before we close, um, I think there is something called about you. You said about um, uh, ransomware vaccine. Uh, yeah, we're working yeah, on. Let's... So yeah, yeah. I think I even shared it a little bit at Black Hat, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so we are. So my biggest problem with the industry, I'm going to give a little rant because this comes with this. This the, we, I'm not working on this vaccine from a you know like yeah we probably got to make some money off the development cost right. But like what my problem with security today is, as CISOs and all this stuff, we get all sucked in. Like you, you remember Bruce Lee right? And his whole message uh, for like martial arts wise when he was like demonstrating at like uh, car, uh, martial arts comp, you know like conventions yeah. and stuff. His whole point was that we got so stuck in the tradition, not that tradition's bad, but he's saying you're so stuck on it that like the practicality of fighting was, you know, was like impractical. It was like, you're too fixed. You're too thinking of like only what your style is. And Bruce Lee's whole point was, was that he came up with new styles. He was kind of the inventor of mixed martial arts to like know who you are and also invent and be creative as part of like, you know, think more like about the fight, not necessarily just the tradition, right? And um, in the same thing, I think that like when we're in security and like you got all these people, these CISOs and everything, they're defending networks and these big organizations, right? Which I do respect. And all the stuff that's already in there is great. But we haven't made any time for disruptive thinking. We haven't made any time for critical thinking anymore. We, we, we depend on the vendors and we've sucked on this Kool-Aid, right? And it's just like, like, I feel like we're the emerging threat because we... You know, we, we like if you take the, the emerging top four emerging threats for the last five years, they're exactly the same. Right. We haven't okay. chipped off one of them. Right. We haven't solved one of them. Right. Like not really. Right. We just keep adding more vendors and solutions and people keep making more promises and stuff. But, you know, people still get broken into. Right. So in in this sense, I was looking at like we need to step back. How does ransomware work? You know, let's break down the TTPs. Let's like break down. Is there some kind of thing? And the question I started asking is, is there a way to turn ransomware on itself? Like the, the only difference between a backup and ransomware is that the threat actor holds the key, whereas the backup, the network administrator has the key because most backups yeah. are encrypted, right? Um, but it's a backup software. That's what it is. It encrypts your stuff and it sends it to the cloud. Well, so does most ransomware these days, right? Um, you know, sends a note, sends an alert. You know, so so the only difference is the threat actor is, is holding the cards, right? So I was like, well, what does ransomware do that is, you know, like that would be one noticeable too and all this stuff? What is it? What does it have to do? So I wrote my own ransomware just in the lab to like kind of like walk through programmatically. Like if I'm writing ransomware, what are the steps I would have to take for it to work? And the first thing it does is recurse directories. Second thing it does is it opens files and puts them in memory. And then it'll start doing the encryption. 
So I worked on this idea where like basically when you open the file, if you have like a dynamic hard drive that only like the, even the OS can't see, but you can do it like maybe at the firmware or some other kind of, you know, you know, way, you could use the, the ransomware to make backups for you. <laughs> so when it opens up the file, you just have it snapshot every time that file, yeah. like, the, you know, maybe even once, doesn't even matter, once a day, right? Just low retention. Should be. What it does is that when ransomware hits, the file system will literally make a snapshot in a totally different drive that's not even on the system. You can't see it, right? And it's literally a matching style of that. So literally, as it's recursing and opening files, it's creating a snapshot for you, right? And creating a backup for you. And all you got to do is get a hit restore and you're done. So essentially, it's like, I just wanted to look at like, you know, the vaccine was more of an idea of like, how do we like start looking at how to solve these problems and turn, you know, it's kind of an offensive yeah. thinking way of like, how do we turn the ransomware? Because I was like, oh, thanks, ransomware. I need to do that backup anyways. I've been meaning to do it. So thanks for doing that backup for me, you know? <laughs> and now just because ransomware just becomes a tabletop exercise, right? And the cool part is that inside that too, you know, when it starts encrypting, right? If you're looking at the files, the entropy is going to start going sky high. If it's using AES, it's going to be higher than seven, seven, uh, you know, Shannon entropy, 7.8, like, uh, you know, versus like 3.0, right? The entropy uh, score, right? So like most files, Texas and that, all that, they're about three. And then based on the size of the files, they still kind of average around four or five. But if they start only like go on order of magnitude where they're going shooting high and all of the files are getting recursive and then the, the, you can literally just go, let's just turn off and make all files zero bytes right now. And you can't even like, you know. Right. And you could stop X though. Right. So that's not even hard. Right. So you can snapshot everything that was already encrypted and you can just like the minute you start figuring that out, it might take a few files for you to figure that out. Right. That's fair. Right. But you see that pattern. You just literally go, you know, if you're at the file level, right. And you're below the operating system, like kind of like think ring negative one, right. Say you're in the firmware or something like that. That is the idea is that you can essentially get like you can tr you know you can control everything that's happening in windows kernel so i was thinking about like we work in forensics we do all this incident response and work in vms and stuff right and we never apply our forensics to real-time approaches right but essentially um you know like us controlling it like when we do forensics like in malware analysis we do api hooks all the time so that we can see what's getting called by malware all the time, right? There's API Explorer, there's all these different ones. Sys, Sys internals does it, right? You can see all what's getting called. This kind of shortcuts you having to reverse everything all the time, right? So it's the same thing. We just cut in and go, every time there's a read, we're gonna make a copy and that's it. And we're not even gonna keep it for very long, so. That's yeah. amazing, Lance. Yeah. But uh, is it like coming soon or? Chicken. Yeah, so we're finishing up the Windows desktop version. We want to test some things on the server side with IOPS and make sure that it's not like going to slow anything down, like big SQL servers or something like that. Um, we're going to be coming out with beta pretty soon. I keep getting told it's like soon, soon, um, <laughs> but like it's kernel development. So it's a little bit like like the last thing I want is some blue screen on your screen while you're just trying to do normal operations. So that's why it's like a little like that. But we do have a Fuse module that does it already. Damn right? you, kernel drivers. So. I know, right? No, but they're, well, especially Windows kernel drivers. Oh, yeah. right. You know, so, <laughs> but we have a Fuse module right now that's in prototype that's being tested by a few uh, players out there right now for like containers and things like that. Um, and like, you know, kind of like uh, cloud providers and stuff. And so that's kind of pretty awesome. Um, and we'll be converting that into uh, beyond prototype very soon. But that one actually works quite well. Um, and so, like, uh, but I'd say I'm hoping by summer easily. Like I'm saying that now because I feel like I said like April, a few, you know, so I'm going to say, I think by summer, no problem. So, so yeah. That's good. You know. That's good. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lance, for being in the show. Uh, I'll make sure to include the, the Ziblin uh, um, um, article yeah. to it. And um, please guys follow um, uh, Lance James on LinkedIn. I think you have, I don't think you have a Twitter, right? Or are you? I, I have my company Twitter, but I got off when Elon Musk started doing stupid things. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll also. I'm just like, uh, I'm over Twitter. <laughs> I got over it real quick. <laughs> yeah. So but if could... you want to follow our Twitter, it's at unit221b. There you go. So, Very good. Yeah. And I'll yep. put also the, um, uh, the, the website, um, mm -hmm. the unit221b website.com. Mm -hmm. And, yep. uh, yeah.com and i'll also include your uh, linkedin account uh awesome. thank you thank you very much and i hope thank you guys I... was... okay sorry <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead i was just saying thank you so. ah, you're <laughs> most welcome <laughs> yeah. and uh, i'll see you guys um next episode for sure thanks all right
Thanks again. Thanks.